he knew in his heart he was gonna he was gonna just expose her and and sure enough man she began to preach and God began to move and people began to get healed and I can't remember the entire story but uh, I, I remember this part when she gave the altar call when she says well anybody need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior he was the first one sitting on the platform raised his hand and the guy next, the pastor next, said, hey, man, you're a pastor. He said, man, that don't mean nothing, man. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm not sure exactly what was all said, but he raised his hand, and, and uh, he said, I, I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. He was apparently at a time of his life where he, I don't care what we're doing in the Lord, we could be up there being used to God in special ways and all kinds of different ways, but we can get off, off track somewhere and lose sight of that because we get caught up in this thing. But see, his time was that day. That was his time. And, and you and I sitting here today, God's got a time for you. It may be today that God wants to do something in your life. Just as the time is right for these kids. The time is right for our schools. And, and that, as Alex said, man, pray. Pray. Just pray for these. That God will open doors. Uh, you know, because... They're trying to shut doors. They really are. I mean, back in the 60s, they, they closed the door, no prayer in school and Bibles and all this and that. But I tell you what, God can open doors that no man can shut. Let's, let's pray. Father, my God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for what you're doing. God, the things that we don't even see, Lord God, as we go about our business, serving you and doing the things, Lord God, that we know to do and the things that we have to do. But Lord God, I pray that you would just show us all as time goes on that we will, we will understand, Lord God. As this pastor, uh, Charles Price, he came to a place of understanding that he, he needed to get right with you. Help us all, Lord God, in these areas uh, to know where we stand and to understand the time when you bring it to us, Lord God, and show us. We love you, God. We, you have your way. This morning, you have your way in each and every one of our lives, Lord God. And we thank you, Father. We thank you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. And I thought about, I missed, we wanted to thank God for the, the glitch in our, uh, what do you call it? Our, okay, amen. Yeah, technical glitch. I don't know, I don't know what happened. I just seen Pastor Art up here and and I'm in a cloud, you know, I'm <laughs> just, just singing and, and then uh, realizing when, when Ben started singing those old songs, I said, man, this is good. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> yeah, it was so good. It really was. God knows what he's doing. Can you say amen? But uh, now this pastor Price wanted to expose Amy Pearson as a fraud. Um, if somebody wanted to expose your life as a fraud before God, what would take place? Would we be exposed or would God expose them? Just like this pastor, he was exposed all of a sudden, living a life. It's not the fact that he was a fraud, doing everything he's supposed to do, but he just needed to make things right with God. And so if, if indeed somebody says, you know what? I see what you're doing, you know, I want to tell the pastor, I want to tell, I want to, I want to go out to the newspaper and this and that and really, would they be exposed or would we be? <laughs> Think about it, you know. Gosh, I remember sitting across the table from a, a pastor. We, well, he wasn't a pastor. He was an evangelist when we first were uh, pastoring a small church. And we, we invited him to come. And he was a well-known speaker. And, and man, he, he up there preaching. He'd point out people and tell them what God wants, what God sees in their life, and this and that, so we had to take them out to dinner after I'm sitting across the table from him, thinking, oh, man, <laughs> what is he going to see in me, you know? <laughs> I'm sitting, you know, what is he going to see? Brother, what I see in you is, <laughs> but thank God for his grace, amen? Praise the Lord. <laughs> but these are the times the line is being drawn. It really is, you know, we may not see it, but these are the times the line is really being drawn in our, our political arena, in, in the spiritual arena. Things are taking place, and we need to really pray. 
the, the zone, the time, the times that you and I are in, what time zone are you in? You know, I saw the clock up here, and I told my wife, check out, there's a clock, you know, because I'm going to have a clock on my, on my uh, overhead. But uh, what time zone are we in? I know uh, we were driving to South Dakota one time, well, a couple times that we went to Nebraska, and we stopped at this uh, Fort Robinson. It's an old Army fort, uh, really famous, and and we just camped out there that night. And I, I just like to kind of get up early in the morning, you know. And so I set my clock for 5:30, you know, because I want to just get out around. It's summertime, you know. The sun's going to be coming up any minute, you know. And my wife says, "Where are you going?" I said, "Taking a walk." And she goes, it's dark. I said, the sun's going to be coming any minute. You know, it's almost 6 o'clock. And, and so I started to walk out the trailer, and I looked, and there was a clock, and it said 3, three o'clock. I said, man, well, check my phone. It says 6 o'clock, almost 6 o'clock right here. And every time we drove through that place, we did a number of times. I had this old flip phone, you know, and that thing would change like three hours. So I asked the lady in the office, I said, you guys got some secret thing going here? <laughs> it's a government, you know, it's a, there was no government for it. <laughs> I said, is there something weird going in this place? And she goes, no, not that I know it. You know? I said, man, every time we drove through that, I said, man, this thing changed three hours. I think it was three hours. Anyways, praise the Lord. Wrong time zone, amen. We got to understand the times that we live in, and, and I think God, for that testimony, we do need to understand what God is really doing in the times that we live in. Can you say amen to that? I'd like to turn our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 5. We're just going to read a passage here, and we will stay in Acts for just a little bit. But uh, Acts, chapter 5, just a, a simple story. Most of us know it about Ananias and Sapphira. And... Um, we're going to read Acts chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. This will not be on the, the screen, this passage right here. It says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold possession. Now, now, let me back up a little bit. God was moving, and this was the time for the church. This was the time for the church. And, and God was moving, man, and... and People were getting saved by the thousands, you know, and things were taking place. And, and, the, the, and many of the people, they, they wanted to see the church grow, and they were, they were selling their possessions and laying their money at the feet of the, of the apostles so that things could take place. They could send people out and all these different things. But it says a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also was privy to it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on them all that heard these things, and the same thing happened to his wife a few hours later. <clears throat> I didn't bring that up to scare anybody, you know, man. Uh, you know, we, we've all told our little lies, you know, in the past and all this and that and, and try to cover up and all these things, but we're forgiven today. Can you say amen to that? <clears throat> we are forgiven. But I wanted to bring that up because this was a time that God was building his church. This was a special, special time uh, in history, that God was purifying his people by the blood of Christ. The, these, these people had pure hearts, and, and God was, was doing something very, very special in and, and the church. Uh, it was a time of purity and growth. And I believe that today that God is doing something special. I'm not saying you know, don't, if you lie, you're going to die or anything like that. Please don't get me wrong. I just wanted to bring this out to the fact that uh, that God was doing something special then, and I believe God's doing something special now. Amen? Amen? I, I believe He is. We may not see it with our, our, our naked eyes, but, but God is doing something special just after hearing what God's doing in the schools and, 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 and all these different things. But uh, 
He's doing something in the church. He's doing something in your life. He's doing something in the world. And this includes judgment. Amen. God promises judgment upon the world, upon the sin of the world, and, and all the things, the, the nations. He, he promised, I mean, it's, it's unavoidable. Judgment will be coming. The Lord loves us. He's, he's a God of love, but he's also a just God. Amen. He's also a just God. And um, I heard somebody say one time that if, if God uh, winked at our sin in this nation, he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, because there's a lot of ugly things going on in our nation. Of course, not just our nation, but around the world. But we're just a big part of that. Um, Acts chapter 17, this should be on the, uh, the screen, uh, verse 24. See, God's got, God's got something special, okay? And it's, a, it's timing. God that made the world. He's, Paul is preaching here to the Greeks. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, to all, life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God's put people where he wants them that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And he, he goes on to say in verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who he has ordained. Now, I, I, this may not mean a lot to you, this passage I just read, but, um, you know, Paul's in Greece, and they had all kinds of things going, all kinds of different gods and all these different things, and, and they had all kinds of things theories of this and that, and everybody had their own story to tell, and they'd go to a place called Mars Hill, and they'd all, everyone would be telling their story and, and the different things that, that they learned around the world and, and all these things. So, so the Apostle Paul is trying to tell them, you know, if, you know, I'm talking about the God that made the whole world, okay, now he's trying to get their attention. And God's trying to get our attention, I believe that. And sometimes we forget what God has done. We forget what God has made. We forget what God is doing. And he is the God that has made, he created the whole world and all things. And uh, he is Lord of heaven and earth. And, and he dwells not in the temples made with hands. And they had their God set up in all kinds of little temples. And, and the Jews began to do this very thing also. And so Paul had his work cut out for him. And I believe that uh, today that uh, our work is cut out, church, God does not dwell in temples made with hands. God dwells in you and I. God lives in his people. We are his church. We are the ones uh, that he has set aside. We are the ones that he's calling into purity and holiness and, and, and people that will just simply mean business with him. We're not going to be perfect, never going to be perfect. But when I find myself in those places, you know, where God reminds me, Mike, you need to get... I know what I need to do, and that is to simply get on my face and, and repent before God and know that my God will forgive me. Know that my God will, will uh, continue to use my life, just as Alex was saying this morning. He's made one blood of all nations, and he says that they should seek the Lord, that we might feel after him, we might grope after him. You know, God's calling the world to repentance. He's calling his church to repentance. Judgment, the Bible says judgment must begin first at the house of God. Amen. That means who? That means you and I. Amen? Get our life together. Get our act together before God. Get our hearts right with him because God is doing th something special in these times. Do we understand the times? Do we understand the times? For in him we live and move and have our being. That, that verse has been sticking with me for quite some time. I think I used it a couple of times here. Adam Clark says, <clears throat> just commenting on that verse, he is the very source of our existence. He is the principle of, 
of life, the principle of life comes from him. We live in him, he says. We move in him, and we are in him. You are in Christ, amen. If you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are in God, amen. We are hid with God in Christ, the Bible says. And we don't want to ever take that lightly. Just as Ben preached last Wednesday, you know, the fear of God, man, tremendous word that, you know, we need to learn to reverence God and put him where he belongs. Amen? Keep him in perspective. Keep our lives in perspective. You know, it's a sad thing for God's people to be blind to the times we live in. Pastor Art brought this out just a short while back. And the opportunities that he gives to us to make a difference in our nation. God has given his church an opportunity to make a difference in our nation. We've got to sanctify our lives before him. But just talking in the natural, you know, just over the years, I've talked to Christians, even family members, voting for candidates because of their promises, because of their character, or not their character, because, because of their gender, or because of their race. You know, uh, we were, I was hoping for a woman president, you know, Trump came along and ruined the whole thing, you know, like, a woman president? Is that all you're looking at? Is it because she's, we want a woman president? What about knowing what they stand for? Pastor Art was talking about this just a while back. Knowing what they stand for. I don't care if we have a woman president. I don't care what kind of president we have what gender they are, what color they are, it makes no difference to me. It's what do they stand for? What do they stand for? And you're probably looking at me, oh, you're a Trump supporter, huh? No, I, I, I support the president. I just support the president, amen? When Obama was in office, I supported him. <laughs> amen. <laughs> just, I, all I can say this is, is when, when election night was there, you know, and all the voting was going on, it was late, and I was really tired. And, you know, they were saying, well, maybe not till tomorrow before all the, all the votes are counted and this and that. And I told Joyce, I'm, I'm just going to go to bed, you know. So I went to bed, and I'm, I'm in there just barely drifting off. She came and she goes, hey, Trump won. I said, you serious, man? I says, and all I said was, not the fact, you know, I, I didn't particularly like the guy, you know. Uh, I didn't even vote for him in the primaries because, you know, I, I just, but uh, when he won, I felt the Lord spoke to my heart. And I've heard a guy on the radio say the very exact same thing. God, you've given us another chance. You've given us another chance as a church. You may not, you may not understand that, but believe me, God's given us another chance. And we need to purify our lives. We need to, to mean business with God. Because the time is right. We must understand the times. Now, first of all, we must listen to understand. Amen? Amen. Okay. And uh, I was, the uh, Bible says in James 1.19, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. You know, when we, when we get our own ideas and we start talking and carrying on, we're going to stir up all kinds of wrath. Amen? So I'd rather learn to listen and that's something I've always struggled with I'm always like waiting to say what I got to say you know when somebody's talking I get, we've got to learn to listen types of listeners years and years ago uh, the company I worked for they just had a class on, on learning to listen and uh, so there was it was really in depth but there's just a few things I want to bring out types four types of listeners the non-listener you know, in Matthew 13, there's a parable, a parable of the seed and the soil. And the Lord talks about the, the, the seed is sown on hard ground. The fowls of the air come and grab it away. Then he goes on to interpret that in verse 18 and 19, that the seed of the word is sown, and people don't listen. People don't understand it, is what he says. They don't understand it, and the wicked one comes and snatches it away out of our hearts, okay? 
So the non-listener, you might be, you may be sitting there this morning, and your hearts may be hard because maybe you're not saved, and, you, and like Pastor already even brought out this morning, well, they took an offering and this and that. Where's you know, that could be something's going through your mind right now. Maybe you've been trampled down by the world for too long, and your heart's grown hard and cold and and bitter. How many of us here this morning may have some bitterness in your heart towards some resentment towards somebody or something? And you're not hearing it. You're not hearing it. Please open your hearts. Please open your heart. These are the times, and God wants us to understand. And then they have the marginal listener. They hear, but they don't. Yeah, they hear what's being said, and they could probably tell you what was, what, what was said. They're easily distracted by their own thinking. Uh, this person tends to stay emotionally detached, detached, knows when to turn the speaker off. Anybody flip the switch yet? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what this guy's saying. I just turn him off, you know. You know when to do it, man. When, when that thing is brought out about you, when, when the finger's pointed at you by the Holy Ghost, when it's pointed at you, sometimes we, well, I don't want no more. I'll turn it off. Altar call's given. I ain't going up there. I've had that before, you know. I don't need to make this altar call until God moves on my heart and shows me some wickedness in my heart or things in my heart that need to be taken care of. Don't turn the speaker off, amen? Don't turn it off. They're the ones in that very same parable. They have no root. And because they have no root, the seed begins to grow fast because it's on, it's on shallow soil and there's rock underneath it, and, but it has no root. It grows quickly, but all of a sudden the sun comes up and cooks it. And he speaks about the, the things of this world that drown out, that choke out, you know, not choke out, but the things of this world that's hard in our life. And, and we're excited about getting saved. We're excited about what God's doing. And we hear, hey, man, preach it, brother, preach it. But then all of a sudden you fade away for some reason or another because you're not seeking God. Okay? But these are the marginal listeners. You may be here today. You're hearing what I'm saying, but you're being distracted in, in something or another. You're not emotionally attached. You're not open to what God really wants to do in your life. The evaluative listener they evaluate everything. They hear, but make no effort to understand the content of what is really being said. Great facts, great in facts, but poor in sensitivity. You form opinions about the speaker's words before the message is complete. I, there was a, years ago, there was a brother uh, I knew fairly well. He got up and walked out of the church. And so the next time I saw him, I said, hey, how come you got up and walked out of the church? He says, I didn't like what they said. I disagreed with what the pastor said. I said, did you hear the whole message? Did you hear what he was really trying to say? Well, no, because that just turned me off right there, and I just walked out. He evaluated what was the same place, take what was being said. And it's kind of like the, the, the seed that was sown into the thorns, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the pleasures of this world, and all these things. Or maybe, maybe sitting there and said, I really don't think God really means what, he's, what the pastor just read. I mean, evaluate the message. We started thinking in the natural, evaluating what's being said. And then, of course, we have the active listener. These are the four listeners, okay? That's all. That's all. We all get there in some, you know, when I read that parable of the, of the seed and the soil, I see myself. God, here I am. I'm the first one. God, my heart was hard today. You know, I have a rough time listening. And, and, and man, the devil seemed to be having a heyday in my life and, because my heart's hard. Or whatever the case is, active listener. Little Samuel, Samuel, the, the, the priest and the prophet, was taken by his mother when he was a young boy. And he, and he promised she promised him back to God 
And so when he was a young boy and he was weaned, she took him to Eli, the priest. And he's here to serve you. He's here to, to, to serve in the house of God and grow in the things of God, take care of him, you know. And so he began working with Eli. And one night God, we know the story, God called him Samuel, Samuel in the middle of the night. Samuel ran, ran to Eli. Eli says, uh, I didn't call you, son. Go back to bed goes back to bed. Samuel, Samuel runs back to Eli. I didn't call you, son. Go back to bed. The third time God called him, he went to Eli. Eli says, son, if you hear that voice again, just say these words. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. I'm listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Do we have that mentality when we come into the house of God? Speak, Lord, for your servant is here to listen. I'm here to hear. I'm here because my time is right. I'm here because uh, I know what's taking place. I understand that, the, that our nation is, is kind of coming apart at the seams. It seems that way. But I believe God has, has his hand upon our nation. If his people, which are called, like he says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face and turn from what? Their wicked ways. Amen. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. Man, what a promise, man. That's, you got to memorize that verse, guys. You know, you just memorize that verse, man. And, and God, he says, if, if I will humble myself and pray before you. You might be one person, but God hears one person. Amen. God has turned wars around because of one person praying. God can turn everything around because of one person praying. And do it because you may be the only one person. But uh, in the parable of the sower, or the seed, it says in verse 23, that this one is the one that understands it and brings forth fruit, some 100, some 60, some 30. Samuel became greatly respected and a very feared prophet. When he came into town, people started shaking. Man, oh man, he's gonna, he got a message from God, you know, and they didn't know what to think. Because Samuel answered that one call when he was a young boy. And God began to, God told him what he wanted to tell him. Go back and tell Eli this tomorrow morning. And it was a hard, it was a hard message, but he did it. God raised him up to be a prophet in the land. Amen. For Israel. So, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, there was a story. Um, Israel was in, a, was in a place, and we'll just read the story, okay? Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 1. It should be on the overhead. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord commanded to Israel they wanted to hear the word they went to Ezra he was the scribe he was the priest Ezra we, we want to hear the word the whole nation everybody was there uh, they, they'd come back to Jerusalem and, and, and they had built they built the walls through Nehemiah and, and there they were they, they needed to hear God's word they were at a crucial time of Israel it was a very crucial time they needed to hear the word of God how I many of you know we're at a very crucial time, church, in, in this, the times that we live in? Do we understand the times? Do we come into the house of God and say, you know what, I need to hear from you, God. I need to hear the word for my life. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the, the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. He was on a platform. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And list the men in verse 7. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Cause them to understand. What do you think preaching is all about? What do you think teaching is all about on Wednesday nights? What do you think the Bible studies are all about? You know, uh, relate groups. What do you think the church is open for? That we might be taught, that we might be caused to understand the times 
and understand the word. The people knew this was a crucial time. The walls, were, I'm not sure it all went on in their own minds, but, but the walls were built, but things were a mess within. They had problems. Nehemiah had to come and straighten a bunch of people out. They had bitterness towards one. They had uh, prejudices. They had all kinds of problems, money problems. Things were taking place, marrying the, the wrong uh, spouses from other country, you know, other nations, and doing all these different things. There was much now to be done in their lives. I mean, you know, there's a whole lot to be done in our lives. I know there's a whole lot to be done in my life. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm old, been safe for a little while, and but still, I don't care. So the day I die, there's going to be much to be done in my life. And I need the word. Amen. I need the word. There was a lot of strife among them. Nehemiah had to straighten a lot of this out, but they needed the word. Thus saith the Lord. See, in the times that are upon you and I, church, the times that we're talking about are out there. What do you see in the news when you see the news coming on? You know, do you, do you see the things that are taking place? Do you see what's taking place? Well, even like just now, all the thousands of people. You know, I feel bad for the people that are coming up from Honduras. They want to come to the United States and find some asylum. They want to get away from whatever. It is. But you know, what's take, you know what's taking place is people are joining in. And you know what's taking place also? That terrorists are, are probably a big part of this, you know? A way to get into the country. A way to get in. I mean, things... That's just my opinion, okay? <laughs> but things, there's more to it than what we just see. All the poor people need, they do need help. They do need help. Big bad Trump is stopping them. The times we live in church, the times we live in, things are taking place that we don't even see. We don't even see. They're upon us. Remember back there in, in the book of Acts that he has appointed time for every nation. He has appointed time to raise up and to bring down nations. And we don't want that to happen in our nation. We don't want that to begin to take place in our churches. We don't want that division. We don't want these things in our lives. You know, Jesus... In Matthew 24, told of all what's going to be taking place at the end times. And man, when I read that chapter, I start seeing things that are taking place. I start th seeing things. Jesus, when they came to the Lord and they says, Lord, when is this all going to take place? What's going to, take, what's going to happen? And the first thing he said was, take heed that no man deceive you. There's a lot of deceit in the kingdom of God. There's a lot of deceit taking place around and and we got to be careful that no man can deceive us no man deceives us now how do we do that church how do we do that do we get a bunch of commentaries and start studying this and studying that and read you know get on the uh, CNN or whatever it is or, or Fox News and and start writing down things and but what about just your relationship with God just a relationship with God. Because he tells us in verse 13, but he that shall endure to the end. He tells us of all the things that are taking place, man, the earthquakes and, and the deceit and the famines and the pestilence and all the things that are taking place today. Things that are taking place today. He says, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. He that endures to the end. How are we going to endure to the end? By being in church and going our way and doing our thing? What about just a good, solid relationship with God? What about a pure heart? What about a heart that understands? What about a heart that can look around and see what's taking place and get on our knees and pray? You know, we have our times also, our appointed time. You know, God is very personal. He's personal with you, He's personal with me very personal and he has an appointed time for your life and like I said in the beginning who knows today could be the time appointed for you to understand something to take hold of something to, to open up and to allow God 
to do what he wants to do in your life. This might be your time. This could be the day. To me, it's very comforting to know that God has appointed time for my life and he, is, he has a specific time he's going to be dealing with us in certain areas of our lives. This might be the day. You know, we may not understand why things are taking place in our life. Why is this taking place in my life? And so and so ain't, it's not, you know, I've been serving God and, and doing my best. I've been trying to raise these kids. I've been trying to do this, and, and God knows. But why is this happening in my life? Why is these things taking place? We need to understand sometimes. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Times of shaking come. Amen. Maybe God is trying to shake us for some reason. Maybe God is trying to do something in our life. Maybe God is trying to point something out that could take us down. Maybe God is trying to show us his power and his love and, and his care upon our life. Things will, are going to take place in your life. I don't care whether you're saved or not. They're going to take place. I'm so glad that I'm on God's side. You know that I know that when things are taking place and the shaking is coming, there is a reason for it. There is a purpose for it. Uh, you know, God said, you know what? Uh, understand this time. Just un have understanding. Just have understanding of the time that you're going through. I mean, this month is October. And, you know, every time October comes on, I start looking around and say, you know, things, things are going to happen, you know. The devil's going to stick his ugly head up and all that. But, but, you know, I'm very confident because, you know what, I feel rooted in God. I feel rooted in Christ. And, and I know that the devil can stick his ugly head up everywhere he wants to. I don't like it. I don't like the things I see taking place. I don't like the things he, that he does come, coming against me. I don't like these things. But I know one thing. Am I going to react or am I going to respond to God's word? Am I going to react to this thing that's taking place? Panic, throw my hands up and I can't take this or am I going to just simply respond to what God's word says? God, your word says, no man will pluck me out of your hand. So therefore I know I'm secure in you. Times of shaking are going to come. I mean, yeah, don't give me no hands or nothing like that, but don't even try to raise your hand. But how many here like to celebrate Halloween? Please don't raise your hand because huh. I used to celebrate Halloween until I began to, begin to understand what it was all about. Until I began to see what the devil was doing. And you watch in television, you know, and these commercials come out about all these different movies, Halloween, and different ones. And I was like, people like that? People love that kind of stuff? Man, why bring evil into your house? Why, why teach your children that, said, you know, evil is good? We just simply need to understand the times that we live in. The times that we live in. And of course, why is, are things taking place in my life? There's a sowing and a reaping principle. Amen? This is something we overlook so much of the time. Like, God, why are you allowing this to take place? Why did that take place? Why does this take place? Why is that, you know, all these different things? What about if we look back a little bit? You know, sometimes I wonder why I got to carry this in my heart. Why is this, you know, why is this taking place? And all I got to do is look back a little bit and say, you know what? Back in the days, you sowed some bad seed. And that bad seed ain't going to just go away. I'm forgiven, Amen. We're forgiven. We're going to heaven. Praise God. God, will not, God, God does no longer see your sin. But anytime you sow bad seed in the soil, Jesus even told a parable about that. What's going to come up? Bad weeds or whatever it may be. I try to explain this to the guys that I have Bible study with and say, you know, you all have sown some bad seeds and you're paying for it now. Thank God he doesn't erase my memory. Sometimes I wish, God, if you could just erase my memory, it'd be so great. I wouldn't even think about this stuff anymore. But thank God he don't. Can you say amen to that? If, if, 
if he erased our memory, we'd wind up, like I was talking to a brother a while back, he says, you know, I used, to, I used to say, God, let me start all over again. But then he started realizing, I don't want to go back because I'd probably wind up being worse. Now just take this thing from me. He has. He's taken it from you. He's taken it out of your life so that you can serve him. Amen. We just simply need to put it behind. As Paul, the apostle said, man, he did a lot of bad things, man. He was accomplished to murder, man. He, he, he burnt churches. He threw people... Christians in jail and all these different things. He says, I'm putting that behind me. And doing what? Reaching forth that which is before me. He understood the times. He understood the call of God upon his life and that he is supposed to go forward and, and do God's will now. Do we understand that? You know, what have we sown in our marriage? And we're reaping Maybe back in the world, we sown a lot of bad seed in our marriage. And, and maybe, what are you sowing even now? We're always going to reap that, okay? It's always going to, until we come to the understanding, you know, I need to start sowing good seed in my family, in my marriage, in my life, in my church, and in my relationships. I need to start sowing good seed. And we're going to see that 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold fruit coming forth, okay, in our relationships. Our relationships are very important. Pastor George got up here Friday night. He was visiting, and he says, you're rich. We're rich. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about, you know? But he says, we're rich because we have relationships that we never had before. We have a family we never had before. We have, you know, rich relationships. And what he's saying is, man, hold on to those things. Treat those things dearly. Be thankful to God for, that he's given us these relationships. And cherish them. You know the prophet of Habakkuk, he could not understand why nothing seemed just on any, and he brought his complaint before God, and he says, God, why is this taking place, and why do I see the wicked rising up, and, and the poor is being pushed down, and all these different things. He couldn't understand until it says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand up on my watch and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. He understood, yes, I bring my complaints before God. Yes, I don't understand why this is taking place, but I'm going to, I'm going to get alone, and I'm going to sit before God, and I'm going to wait until he comes and he speaks to me. And sure enough, God came to speak to him. God came to speak to him. And you read on where he began to pray and he began to praise God. He began to understand because God spoke to him. The appointed time is yet to come. Habakkuk, you wait. Sometimes, church, we just simply got to wait on God. Amen? The appointed time is coming. We're, God, we're going to see God's hand move in a special way. It is coming. He understood. He understood. And, and he began to praise God. He began to pray. And he began to say, God, send a revival. Lord, revive us now. God, I'm ready. I'm ready. He's no longer praying, why this and why that? Now he's saying, God, revive us. Revive us. This is something we need in our hearts. God, revive my family. Revive my heart. Revive my church. Revive this nation of ours. Revive us, O oh Lord. Not looking at all the negative things. You know, there's a, 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 uh, a verse in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. They're naming all the, the Israelite tribes that came to serve under David. David is, is, is you know, he's out there. He's, he's, get, he's anointed king, but he's, no, he's not king at this time. And he's running. He's running from Saul. And, and, he, and he's building up. People are coming, man. Armies are armies forming. But the people of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, says, and the children of Issachar, speaking of them coming to serve under David, which were men that had understanding of the times. They knew what was taking place. They understood, man, that, that Saul is going down and, and David is the one that's being raised up. Uh, we need to back him up. We need to stand with him. They understood the times. And they knew, it says, he went on to say, they knew what Israel needed to do. And they were going to be part of that. Church, things are taking place. 
Do we as the church of Jesus Christ today understand the times? Do we, do we know what we ought to do? Are we aware that there are going to be battles ahead? Amen? They knew that there was going to be battles. They knew, and we need to stand behind this man, David, because God has anointed him. God has anointed him. You know, the Bible says we, in him we live and move and have our being. But it tells us in that very passage there in, in the book, Acts, that, that we need only to call upon him. Just call upon him. He's there. He's, he's here, church. I always say that. He's here. When I go to do Bible study, I tell the guys, you know, God is here. This don't look like a church, but God is here. He's in this room because you're here. We need only call upon him and receive his word as a truth and the guide to our lives, okay? Giving us understanding of our times so that we might know what to do. How do I conduct my life? How do I conduct my life before you? Lord, what in my life do I need to understand? In Romans 13, 11, that will be up on the screen. You know, the Lord tells us, you know, to, to repent. The Lord tells us, uh, uh, and knowing that the time, that now is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Let's go ahead and bow our heads this, evening, this morning, if you would. Bow our heads, close our eyes. Think about what was said. Think about what went on in your heart, your mind.